Uh, we have one rule here uh, that must not be disobeyed, and that oh. is one fool at a time, and I'm the fool with a microphone. So, uh, and this the is the rest College of, of Complexes, right, Brom? Right, yeah, you think so. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just trying to explain uh, what the College of Complexes was uh, to uh, somebody who wandered in here. They regularly have been here for 40 years. But, yeah, what is it? Uh, All right, if that completes our announcements, we will hear from our speaker. Uh, the format is this, that the speaker holds forth for as long as he can hold out. And uh, after about an hour, we allow him to sit down uh, and listen to the rest of us. Uh, but uh, after he's fielded them, your questions, and uh, you all have questions, I'm sure. Uh, but it, I don't know how long it will take him to respond uh, to your questions. He could uh, say, uh, uh, that's a ridiculous question, and, and uh, we would have to move on to the next. I will recognize your questions in the order that I recognize them. And <laughs> after uh, the fielding of questions, we have our rebuttal period in which any and all of you are entitled to hold forth on what you think is all right. So, without any further ado, we will hear from our speaker tonight, A.J. Signari. Uh, thank you for um, allowing me to um, speak to your group. Um, I've been, I know about couch complexes for some time. Um, I used to uh, I used to uh, live an hour and a half outside Chicago, so I never had the chance to come and hear all your speakers. But I've heard many good things about the college complexes with the presenters that've been here. Um, tonight's topic um, we'll be talking about is how building community, how to do that, and let me put this into context. Um, I've been an activist, an organizer. Uh, campaigner in both politics and issue-based campaigns for over 12 years, uh, starting since high school in a small town in Sterling, Illinois. Um, that's right next to Dixon, Illinois, where you know, Maria Cronwell with all of her billions of dollars. Um, that's the area I live in, you know, Mount Raven country. That's where I live. And I've done most of my stuff throughout the Midwest and some parts of the United States with my involvement. And most recently, I've been writing articles for like Independent Voter Network, Rising Star Magazine, which is an online magazine, um, Dissident Voices, um, a few other outlets, and I speak around the country on various topics, um, my areas I have done. So, so what's building community? Um, for me, building community goes back to what Saul Alinsky said in the 40s, and that definition is that you build community by bringing people together based on common interests. So after be learning about Saul Alinsky, what he's done over the years, I've read his books, learned from people who have worked underneath Alinsky and their and what have you. Um, and then for my organization, the Foundation I Front, we just took that a step further. And we want to bring organizations and people together based on common interests. Because I've always been of the opinion over the years that organizations, when it comes to certain nonprofits, political campaigns, excuse me, political organizations, that they have their side blinders on. And we want to remove those side blinders and have everyone think of a big picture. So that's the essence of what I'm talking about, is trying to think more big picture, networking with people of common interest. Another way of looking at it is this. Imagine, if you will, a coral reef. So if I say coral reef, I give an idea what that looks like. This massive thing under the ocean. It has fish, it has coral, sea fans, 
moray eels in it. But the basis of the entire coral reef is that it's a, it's a living organism. Fish feed off coral for various reasons. Moray eels are in the coral for various reasons. So everything's built around the coral reef. That's the kind of approach that we're doing, is that everything around here, from the organizations and political involvements and what have you, are all connected to one fashion or another. So whether you're fighting on single payer health care, whether you're fighting on fracking, whether you're fighting on government reform, everyone has resources. You just need to work with the other person because, let's say, Organization A doesn't have what Organization B does. For example, that could be fundraising resources, that could be media resources, that could be just personnel resources. Um, a great example that's not too, too not far from here is an organization called Multicult. It's right here on Michigan Avenue. Um, I think that's Wicker Park neighborhood, if I, if I remember right. And in Multiculti, they have a community dark room, so people can go and take photography, and you can use, utilize that dark room. There is a community radio station where a person can have a radio program and talk about whatever they want to talk about. They have a green room, so organization will, in fact, Bound Integrity use their space to put a commercial out, and that's how they use it for stuff like that. They have a music space that they use for fundraising for organizations to come into. So their premise is, it's an artist commune, yes, but anyone can come in there and utilize their resources. It's a very open space. This is kind of the same thing that what Occupy Chicago's doing, what they have their office on 500 CERMAC, it's a space that everyone can come to utilize it, utilize their resources, so they can make posters, they can use it for a meeting, organization space, in fact, our Walmart campaign, um, they asked us, <coughs> when I was with um, Occupy Chicago, came to us and said, can we use your space and everything? Sure, why not? So they come in, we, we plan out things for the Black Friday events and everything. These are the kind of things I'm talking about. Um, I feel that everyone needs to work together on the same issue, whether you're on the progressive side or the radical side. Um, we all need to work together because I think the left needs to come together. Um, I think it's broken down for various, for a lot of reasons, um, politically, and excuse me, and for greedy purposes, in my opinion. So um, um, I'm just gonna leave it at that. It's like I said, I just want to keep it short and simple, and I like to be more involving, engaging with questions and everything, because this is a huge topic. I can go on and on. I don't want to bore you with details and what have you. So I'll be more happy to answer any questions you guys have along this. And I see Dr. Laura. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> your foundation uh, is named, and where is it, and who's funding it? How are you getting The foundation I front, a um, little story about that. Um, I started it when I did my own consulting business in 2006. It was called PR Consulting. And I did that after working on many campaigns and everything. And in 2009, I formed this organization, the Foundation I front, on my own. And just go around the, yes, mostly around Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, and doing what I'm just telling you, talking to organizations, trying to bring them all together, have conversations. And then around 2010, had a board, got a board of directors, have a staff. And so it's twofold. We do, I just explained what we do, was try and bring, build community by bringing people together. And the other component is that we do educational activities. We have Something similar to this, but um, we have a speaker series called the Speaking Freely Speaker Series, and we bring people in activism, politics, and the not-for-profit sector to have conversations. Um, we, it's based out of Springfield, Illinois, and I'm setting up shop here in Chicago. We started it last year with the speaker series, and we brought Bill Ayers down. Um, as you can imagine, that was, that went over very well in Springfield, and so. Uh, that happened, and then we brought Ward Churchill out, all the way up, out from Colorado, um, to have a conversation. And this year, we are, again, having Bill Ayers. We're also having Tom Tresher, as you guys all may know, with um, No Game Chicago. He also ran for Cook County Board President in 2010. Um, 
and so we're also going to have other people, I hope Dr. Laura will agree to it as well, um, to be in our speaker series. And we also do forums, and we also do conventions. So speaking of funding, it, we, our funding is the educational program. So we have no grants. Um, it's, all of, it's all of us. It's all of personal involvement and um, sweat equity. And it's based off what we charge. We charge like $20 for admission for our speaker series and it's split to two ways. Um, we get $10 and then we use the Southside Freedom School that my friends and I started in the Hyde Park Woodlawn area. <clears throat> and they get $10 because they give us a space for them, essentially for free, so it's a donation from us. So, so hopefully that answers your question. Can you give us yeah. the website and the uh, uh, little bit about how to find out more information about yeah, it? Yeah, the website is on www.billandsarity.org. Um, we also on our Facebook, it's facebook.com slash building solidarity as well. Yes, the uh, website is www.buildingsolidarity, one word, dot org. And on Facebook, you can like us on facebook.com backslash building solidarity as well. And how would one be able to sign up for your speaker series? Um, you can just email me at um, aj at building solidarity dot org. Okay. Then we have other questions. I'm going to take you in the back and I'm going to take you right here. Yes, we're in the back. Um, are there examples of neighborhoods or small communities or elsewhere in which you have worked with the people to achieve a greater sense of community and practical community? Uh, uh, Accomplishments? Are there something you could point to? Yes, and I don't, the one thing I will point to is the um, cooperative movement. I think that's the best example I can provide. Um, <clears throat> when I used to live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I used to live in a neighborhood called River West. Um, a comparable neighborhood in Chicago would be putting Rogers Park and Hyde Park together. That's River West in Milwaukee. They're very artistic. Um, near University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, and um, it came off from the counterculture movement a little bit. So there's a lot of hipsters, radicals in the neighborhood as well. We have a lot of cooperatives. We have a food co-op. We have a resource center up there as well with a free store, so people can drop off their clothes wherever they want, and people can get them free. Um, my friends and I started the second bar cooperative. When I say bar, I mean drinking establishment. Second bar cooperative in the entire country where the workers actually own the bar. The first one's in Austin, Texas. Um, and we also have a um, bookstore cooperative as well. So I would say the cooperative movement, workers collective cooperatives, are probably the best example of building community because at the public house, that's, that was our thing. We were a business where you can come in, have a beer, have wine, have a cocktail, but we also, it's an open space. We have a stage, we literally had a soapbox where you can come and air your grievances right then and there. You know, you can have a conversation at the, the bar and then if you want to say how Obama's great, you can do that. You want to say Green Party's great, you can do that. Wherever you want, you can do on the soapbox. Um, and other organizations have utilized our space for meeting spaces. Um, the whole Scott Walker strike, we all met there. Um, all the organizations, progressive, radical organizations, came into the bar as a meeting place and everything. So to answer your question, yes. Um, I, would, you'd, I would look at the cooperative model, especially what Mondragon has done in Spain with that corporation, because they actually build community because they're providing jobs in the Basque region of Spain, but they're also providing resources by bringing other people together to strengthen their business as well. You sir, right here. It's about the same question. Are you sure? Uh, brought the you guys groups want? together, and they have different okay. viewpoints, and then problem. they have something in common. Uh, yes, no um, an example of that would be in Springfield, when the women's issues in the political campaigns was a hot issue. We try to bring both the left and the right side of the argument together 
to have this conversation about women's rights. What does it mean? So we brought the Rights to Life movement in and Planned Parenthood and the LGBT community and single mothers and we try to talk, have this conversation, what does it mean about women's rights? Because everyone has a different perspective of what women's rights are. Um, we try to do a, a panel on that. The um, LGBT community, and we had single mothers, we had some <coughs> black feminists who were involved, but of course Planned Parenthood and Right to Life um, did not come. And that was a very um, sad part because I was hoping one, not the other, would show up. Good conversations. So, so, so it was um, a plus, but it was a downside because we wanted both sides of the argument. Because with our foundation, we want to hear both sides of the argument, not just on the left. Even though we are lefty people, we also want to hear from the right because they have their fair shot too. That's what freedom of speech is all about. You have that right to speak wherever you want to and want to hear from that perspective as well. Hopefully that answers your question. I'm going to take you over uh, you keep uh, mentioning uh, that you want to bring the left and the right together yes. in your forums. Yes. Uh, uh, do you, um, have, at any of your forums, have you had um, uh, the Libertarian Party or Libertarians uh, attend? Oh, yeah, I mean, some of my good friends are Libertarians. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, I like them. <laughs> I have no problems with Libertarians. In fact, um, one of my good friends down in Springfield is a libertarian on a radio show, um, Bishop on the Air, um, and he makes it known that he's a libertarian, and I'm like, more power to you. Um, so yeah, I mean, we go libertarians, you know, even green socialists, communists, anarchists, you know, we bring them all in, because I myself am a Marxist, anarchist, and green. So I bring all my friends in, involved as well. So. Yeah, we listen, listen all sides. We're not discriminating. Okay. Marxists, Marxists, anarchists, and the Greens. So what, what do you think about Republicans? You want my um, personal opinion or a diplomatic answer? Well, uh, are they welcome? Of course, yeah. Republicans so are, are welcome. take a bigger chug of the beer than that. <laughs> um, Republicans are welcome. They're more welcome to talk about their issues. You know, we even invited them. Will they come? No. But we do extend that invitation out. Um, I did mention we had Bill Ayers come down to Springfield. We had a protest of people at our event. Um, it was $15 at the door at the time. And then I said, just come on in. It's free. Come on in. We want to hear your stance. Why, do, why don't you like Bill? Come on in. And they want to come in for free, and we, huh. have, and we have food and drinks. I said, I said, pick anywhere you want to sit. I don't care. Everything's on me. It's free. Everyone paid their fifteen dollars. You're fine. And then they just walked away. So yeah, I mean, they always have their right to come and talk, and we extend that invitation out. It's just a matter of them taking the next step and following through on what they want to say. You and I'll take you. Okay. Who's next? Well, I have him, Charlie, and I have you. I was wondering if you interest. You're welcome, honey. You need change. Thank you, sir. Your interest. Great. Your activity. Can you take a little bow? Hey, would you say you were here? Loud, please. Yeah, hi. I already said hi, though. I was wondering if your activities, your interests, have ever come in conflict with organized crime? And if so, how do you resolve them? No. <laughs> You're lucky. You're not coming to the forum. <laughs> Are you saying, like, my my involvement and our organization's involvement involved or tied into organized crime? Is that, is that, was that what I'm hearing? Uh, have they ever come into conflict with organized crime? Yes, no. Yeah, I've been an outspoken advocate of gun control for a number of years. And in the past week alone, I've gotten at least a hundred pieces of hate mail 
<laughs> from various NRA types. Yes. And you're suggesting I invite them all to a room like this and I'm going to have a conversation with them. Check your guns this is at what the door. You're recommending, AJ. Check your guns at the door. You are, and what do you expect is going to happen? Gonna... So, I'm sure, if I remember right, you're a lifelong resident of Chicago, correct? Yeah. So, you know the, the whole bug house debates there at Newberry Library across the street? <laughs> we go there every year. Okay, that's what I think. That's what I thought. I thought, I, see, I, I thought I'd see there a few, a few times. So, yeah, so I mean, that's what I am advocating, you know. Even though they do not fit what you personally believe in, you still ought to have that conversation. Another way looking at it is this. As I said, I told you who I am. You know, my sleeve, you know, Mark says anarchist in Greek. That's who I am. Having said that, I also am a student of political philosophy. You know, I'm trying to finish my master's in political philosophy at the University of Chicago at this moment. Um, so one of the people that I've always <coughs> liked of what he did, not him personally, was William Buckley. And here's why. As some of you know, William Buckley, um, the conservative philosopher, brought all the conservatives in the 50s together. Because at the time, the conservative movement was so broken, they couldn't get anyone elected, they couldn't come to the table on anything. But it was William Buckley who brought social conservatives, religious conservatives, fiscal conservatives, other conservatives together and had this conversation like, what do we need to do? Okay? From the 50s all the way through the 80s, they got people elected, they brought everyone to the table, which is why we have the Brookings Institute, which is why we have National Review, which is why we got Ronald Reagan elected, Bush, Bush 1 and 2 elected. So what I'm saying is, yeah, whether you're in the left or the right, you should bring people together. So I'm taking that concept to a more wider model and trying to bring everyone to the table and have a conversation, a serious conversation, on why do you think the way you think, and is there any common ground? Because I always feel there's always common ground somewhere. I'm not saying compromise your principles, just have that conversation. Hopefully that makes <coughs> makes sense or reaches what you want to hear. I will go on. Okay. I, I, Let that stew for a minute. No, I, <laughs> I'm going to... There's either guns or no guns. And what's what's the? What's the conversation? Yeah, I mean, listen, guns kill. Yeah. There's only way to stop killing. No right. guns. Right. What do you have, like, soft guns or? But see that, and that's and that's a very conversation. So, um, we didn't do it this year when the gun issue was on its apex, or excuse me, when it's on its peak in conversation. We would have done a forum of people who are NRA members, who are anti-gun, law enforcement, what have you. We would have we would have a forum and have this conversation like, why do you feel you need guns? Why do you feel there shouldn't be guns? Is there a compromise? If not, then what can we do from here? Because I feel people need to be educated on issues because I don't think a lot of people are educated on issues. They watch things on TV, they read things on the internet, they read things on Facebook, but have they actually sat down and actually talked to somebody? I have a friend back in Princeton, Illinois, who's a law who's a law enforcement person, a canine officer, and he's a gun advocate. He wants to have a gun in everyone's hands. And he's my best friend. I was in his wedding. You know, I mean I'm a single I'm a single child and he's and he's essentially my brother. Now do I do I uh, uphold his ideals? No. And he and I know that. Just one, one follow-up. Yes. I've got a loony neighbor who has guns. Are you suggesting I go over there, knock on his door, and say, oh, I'd like to have a conversation with you? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Know your neighbor. Uh, why? Just, just know your neighbor. Well, how nutty is he? <laughs> maybe if you have a gun truck, maybe you have a gun truck. I just want to kill Is he shooting out his window? I should just yeah, bring a pie, a cake. No, I just get a standard. 
I need you and I'll come back over here. Let's bring over some Amy. Uh, Sha you, you. Yes. you have these cooperatives in uh, Milwaukee and you've worked around. What are the what are the sorts of organizational <laughs> schemes that you can see that would allow um, groups that are somewhat disparate to work together? So I'm a fan, if you're looking to think like a business model, is the network design model. And the only company that has this, that I am aware of that has this model is DreamWorks. DreamWorks? Yes. DreamWorks, you know, and any other business model you have, CEO, vice presidents, department heads, all that. DreamWorks is not like that. DreamWorks has Steven Spielberg, um, David Katzenberg, um, and David Geffen. You know, so we have Steven Spielberg who does movies well. Katzenberg does animation well. David Geffen, for those of you who don't know David Geffen, um, he had Geffen Records who brought in bands like Nirvana, Aerosmith, Soundgarden. So he was known in the 90s and the late 80s. So what their model is, that they come together and bring all the resources together. Steven Spielberg has all the actors, he has studios. Um, Katzenberg has animation labs and everything. Geffen has people, he has money. So they'll come together and pull the resources together to come out with movies like Buzz's Life. They bring in people like um, Darius Rucker in. So all these great movies and animations and music that DreamWorks does is that model. They pull all the resources together. There is no CEO. There is no vice president of anything. They just come together and just utilize their resources. So that would say, from a business model perspective, I would say DreamWorks would be that model. Can you elaborate a little bit more on where to find more information about the model? I would, I would say, um, just go to DreamWorks, you know, Google DreamWorks. And uh, I would even go as far as DreamWorks and network design models because I know like the, it's the Booth School, the business school in Chicago is Booth, if I remember right. Um, the, the business school in Chicago has these kinds of models. Um, I know Harvard has these kinds of models. So if you just like Google um, DreamWorks and network design model, you can find images of what this looks like. I'd be more than happy to email you what it looks like because I have it on a PowerPoint presentation um, so I can show that. So I mean, if you guys want to see me after this and I'll be more than happy to email you what that design looks I'll like. Take, I'll definitely take that. I have you and I'll have you over here. Did you have a question? My apologies. I only have a statement to make about the gun thing. The gun thing is this. You have 10 children. You have a beautiful wife. You have all this love. Would you rather have your family protected? As long as the gun is in the house, okay? I'm not saying that they should be able to get around. There's, there's so much bad out there right now. I have a gun card. I own 15 guns, but you know what? I don't carry it with me. They're in my properties in Wisconsin and in Chicago. Born and raised here for over 50 years. I do have kids that are, my one daughter, she's 28, she's a lawyer now. The thing is, is you know what? Your family should be protected. All right. Your wife should be protected. We're talking about okay. how to dis Now, now to here's, here's the thing. We'll have a chance at the end of his questions for a rebuttal period where you get a chance to get up there and, and start. No, no, it's it's no problem. With with new people, it's it's something in there. Well, we go. Go. I just wanted to make a statement. No, no problem at all. I believe, I believe yeah, you believe in the However, it is a question if you wish to respond to yeah. it. Yes. No, it's a gun committee. It's, it's diverting from the subject. <laughs> well, I didn't, well, let's just get, let's get to, the, to the question. You have it. You handle it here. No, no, yeah. don't, no problem. Who's, uh, I saw a hand over here, I thought. Question about yes. that business model. When you look at DreamWorks, you're, you're looking at several people who have, I don't want to say infinite resources available to them, but they have incredible resources available to them. And a lot of the nonprofits and community organizations and grassroots organizations that I've worked with, um, a lot of them do have the sort of people power there, but very limited resources in other ways. And I think that with organizations that they feel that they have to compete against other organizations for limited funding, and that really drives the wedge and causes people to worry about their, their job security, if, if that's an issue. And, and it just, 
really, um, it can really eat away at, a, at an organization. And I think that, that what I've seen is organizations are feel that they're sort of protected by their good mission, but they, they forget that these other vectors are relevant and dangerous. So the the two no the two things that you brought up is is the very thing um, our organization is about. I don't know. I'll have to and that is not for profits do have limited resources, and they also have the high burnout rate as well. Having said that, there are some more not for profits who have money, they have resources. Okay, I'm just gonna somewhat pick on Laura for a minute because. This, what she's doing is a good example. So we have the coalition, right? right? But there's also SAFE. There's also a lot of other environmental groups out there. That doesn't mean that the coalition, SAFE, and other people can come together about one issue, whether it be fracking or just the environment alone. Dr. Lord knows people. Rich Whitney down in Carbondale, Illinois knows people, attorneys, what have you. One orga environmental organization have fundraising resources. One environmental group. So my point is, these are the very things I'm talking about. Coming together on an issue like this, organizations or individuals to come together and pull your resources together. Because the things I found, is as, as you found, everyone's territorial. We need to stop being territorial. What are we being territorial about? How do you overcome that resistance? I mean, intellectually, you can know that's what needs to happen, but. It's just like anything else. You just have to like say, you know what? You've been doing this for X amount of years. I mean, you dealt with it with Sierra Club. What they do to you? Screwed us. <laughs> they screwed them. But how long is it going to take for Sierra Club to figure out that they're losing members because of a vote that didn't go their way? Membership is lost because of whatever reason. That's the very thing I'm talking about. And it's the bigger organizations I'm more concerned about than smaller organizations. It's the bigger organizations that I'm talking to the most. Because I have friends and I also have connections in those bigger organizations, I'm like, look, single payer healthcare. We'll say single payer healthcare for a minute. Single payer healthcare was an issue. We want that on the table. We want public option on the table, right? But no, Obama didn't do it. All right, I'm not being on Obama's stance right now. But I'm just saying that you know Obama's off the table. He's bending more to the insurance companies and everything. But we had. Single payer healthcare group A being territorial and B and C being territorial. It's like why? It's single payer healthcare. You want public option. I want public option. Get your crap together. You know, you have resources. You have resources. Pull them together. That's what I'm talking about. So the things that you want to overcome, you seriously just need to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And yeah, there's gonna be a burnout, but eventually someone's gonna realize that, you know. We're, nothing's going right, so we have to do something, and that's why we have the right people, I feel, in our very circles that can come together to fight on issues. You know you know people, Laura, I know people, Charlie knows people, you know people. So in this room right now, I'm seeing almost 40 people, maybe 30 people in here. I, you can't tell me not one person here knows the right people or the right resources, and we can fight on one issue easily. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess we just have to keep at it and whittle it down. Whittle it down, whittle it down. Okay. You've uh, early on mentioned the uh, number of speakers that you've had at various occasions, and it seems to me that all of them were male. Particularly, you mentioned that Bill Ayers spoke yes. twice at your. Have you ever considered? Bill Ayer's wife, Bernadine Dorn. Yes, and in fact, we invited her. She's, come, she's one of our speakers this year. Um, since her and I have conversations. Um, we're trying to figure out a date for her to come. But having said that, um, we have also had other female people. We had Starhawk come out to St. Louis for an event down there that we did. Well, actually, you were down there for the Occupy um, State Summit, excuse me, Regional Summit down there in St. Louis. So we had Starhawk down there. Um, Farheen Akeem up in, um, excuse me, the Twin Cities in Minnesota was talking about, oh, excuse me, the Arab community, how to fight in the Arab community, what's going on in the Arab community, what can Occupy do 
especially with Arab Spring and everything and all that. So yeah, we, we I didn't talk about those, but yeah, we do have some, but we were trying to get more um, female and more diverse speakers involved as well. You and you. Uh, uh, there's a woman where I live, and she says she gets more out of Russian news on Occupy Wall Street yes. than you get out of the United States. Yes. She don't get it all. Yes. So what are they exactly doing? What are some of their activities? Who, Occupy or what? Occupy Wall Street. A lot of things. Uh, Occupy's doing a lot of things, and um, what... The um, media outlet that you're, a neighbor or a friend yeah. is referring to as the Russian Times, RT. Russian Times, Al Jazeera, English, and the BBC has been more focused on Occupy, then Fox, then MSNBC, then CNN. So what's Occupy doing? Well, we're still meeting. I mean, <laughs> that's what we do. We, we still meet. And um, right now, we're just trying to... Occupy Sandy. Occupy Sandy. There's Occupy Sandy. You know, there, Occupy Wall Street is helping out with the, with the Sandy relief efforts and everything. Um, so, I mean, there is that going on. And right now, I think the last thing that we're just, we just had a conversation when I say we occupy Chicago, we're doing um, a Chicago Spring in April, April 7th. And that's going to be focusing more about education, the environment, and workers' rights. So that's like the fight right now because with Occupy Chicago, we're working more with like Walmart, trying to unionize Walmart, Target, Home Depot, things of that nature. You. Um, how, apart from uh, outright political issues, yes. have you found um, any way at all to um, motivate individuals? individuals in, especially um, in a city like Chicago. To have a sense of community, come together for common good, and, 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 um, um, and, and this giant city like Chicago, where there's practically no sense of community whatsoever for most people. That's true to a degree, and I say that because most of my time and effort has been in Chicago. I used to live in Logan Square, now I live in High Park, and all of my friends, all of my network circles are mostly in Chicago. Gay Liberation Network, Green Party, Socialists, Anarchists. You know, there's organizations, but, but what about the sense of And, and my, what I was going to continue on is saying, all these conversations I'm having with all my circles is that they would like to have community, but don't know how to do it. Or they feel they know what they're doing, so they're going to keep on keeping on. All right? So these are the conversations I'm having by saying, you're doing fine, but how come you're not talking to this organization who's doing something else? So there is a sense of community, but some organizations and some communities are not talking to each other. In fact, in fact, this morning I was down in Roseland at the African Community Convention, which is the Uhuru movement. They had a convention, and they had the panel for the first time about LGBT in the black community, specifically the Uhuru movement, because they feel there's a disconnect between gay, black community and the white gay community. They understand that there is a, they need a bridge. So they were having a, they were having a panel today to have that conversation. They even had a conversation about how to incorporate more women, more feminist groups, more black women involved and you so people are having these conversations and I think 2013 is the year for all organizations to have this conversation because it didn't happen years ago I would say in the last 10 years it's never happened and now everything's filtering right in front of us so it's 2013 with austerities happening with fracking going on with government reform this is the year to build community and there was and everyone wants to know how to do it yeah, what's your answer to that? Uh, have you found any way to motivate individuals? My, my, my only personal way is to actually get into a room and talk. We're meeting at multi-call Talk about what? About 
Well, okay, let's talk about, say, the, like the gate community. You know, we're going to have a multi culti. I'm going to buy pizza, and we're going to have this conversation about what we need to do. And it's going to be either about an issue or an action, or just have this general conversation about how we bring people together. That's what I'm talking about. So, yeah, actually, you have to force people to come and meet at times. I know, it's not, I know that's not an answer that's not settling well, but I mean, sometimes you have to do that. Because, um, in fact, one of our panels um, coming up for the foundation is a socialist panel, inviting people with Socialist Party USA, Socialist Alternative, Socialist Workers, Social Equality, and have this conversation about you all derive from one origin. There's many of you, and we have to have the conversation. But what can we do to help this community? Now I feel like um, I'm at the Apollo Theater and Mr. Sandman's going to take me off the. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, but having got here, we're going to go first. Having got here late, I'll take the risk that my question hasn't already been answered. Yeah, you can take the time too. I'm familiar with the thought about by thought by people like Archdeacon Greer about organizational principles. Mm -hmm groups like this. I've heard a lot of talk about organization and this and that. What about organizational principles? Um, the likes of John Michael Greer argues that folks ought to think about going back to stuff like Robert's Rules instead of doing what Owls did, which was do the, the touchy-feely consensus method, which is so easy for infiltrators to effectively sabotage. So his argument goes. Are, familiar with, are you familiar with that old debate? There is one, and Charles Hugh Smith, yes. I personally corresponded with is another. Any thoughts about that? Whole so thing? you're actually talking more about mechanical things. That's right. The, the, the so, what, so what you missed, and there's a test later, um, <clears throat> the premise of like what I do and what my organization, the Foundation I Front, is that Solinsky, 1940, definition of you, bring, you build community, you, bring, you create community by bringing people together on common interests. Okay? So what you're asking is, I understand the argument. Um, you, I'm of the opinion that consen you can strive for consensus. And you can do build consensus at organization meetings and everything. The whole infiltrator thing, you have to filter that out yourself, in my opinion. To understand you got the argument as to why Howe's got to these people got sabotaged by having the 90% consensus rule. So 11% could veto everything. Yes, I, I'm, I, am, I am aware of that debate. I've been a part of that debate myself. And if you wanted me to say I'm more consensus than Robert's rules, then my one my one response would be I'm for consensus building. If you're asking me how do you do that, again, any organization you're a part of in order to strive for consensus or if you're worried about infiltrators, I mean, I guess that's what that's why I'm confused. I mean, what are you actually wanting? The argument of the likes of Charles Hugh Smith is that a dedicated group of 11 percent, so to speak, infiltrated. They could be G men, they could be Marxist, Leninist. It doesn't make any difference. All right, but they know, they show up. They make sure they bring 11 percent to each meeting to block every proposal other than what they have an axe to grind about, whatever it is. And so nothing could get settled. And eventually everyone else threw in the towel, so the RN goes, and they end up calling the two by default. And that's happened. I've seen that happen before. Um, it does happen. That is reality. There's no sugarcoating about that. I mean, that does happen. Um, and I do believe you ought to bring your allies in to get that 11% you know, that, that argument in order to block or to Jeffrey, where you need to get done. Pack, um, All right, I, guess still, I guess I'm still confused. I mean, again, I understand the debate, I'm part of that debate. Um, Anybody over here? I advocate it, Boston cream but pie? I guess I'm more confused on what you want well, me to respond to. Well, 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 what Greer argues is instead of allowing 11% to block something, it takes 
50% to block something if you go back to yes, Robert's right. rules. So what, I, what I'm actually talking about more is more thinking big picture, not actual mechanics. Okay. All right. So that's what this whole presentation, I was thinking more about a big picture scheme than actual mechanics. I mean, I'd be more than happy to talk mechanics afterwards because that's the, the other thing they've done. But, um, sounds like Okay, and we'll talk more because I want to know more about that. Laura, oh, shit. Yeah. This is what happens when you turn around. I, okay. One, I'm two, sorry, it was uh, yeah, another mechanics uh, conversation. And that is, it, it, in my experience, and I've been an activist for a long time, the reason why groups don't come together is the competition rule, okay? That's the reason, what you brought up. And then another reason is because there are different levels of truths. They don't recognize, uh, like, move on, still thinks electoral politics works, okay? And Green Party doesn't, okay? You know, they're both very liberal lefties. And if you ask them, you know, are you against the war, la, 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 they'd all agree, okay? But it's that level of truth, that it's their experience. The Green Party is like, no, this sucks. We need our IRVS or the... You know, the country's going down What's the What's your question? So, my question is, is, well, how do you get to some common basis of truth between disparate groups? Or trying to find a common denominator between groups? Yes. Yeah. I, I alluded to it earlier over here. And when you have these meetings, when you have these sit-downs with individuals or representatives from whoever you want to bring in, say an environment. You need a good meeting to hash out grievances, to hash out this is my agenda. And that's the, that's the other thing I think is lost, is that when we have these kind of meetings to organize, to bring allies, partners, whatever you want to call it, we don't talk about our agenda. You need to be up front, all right? So if I'm Green Party, I'm going to tell you up front, I want my guy elected, this is what I'm about. If it's fracking, well, I just care about this. <coughs> Hash them out. Okay, so we air these grievances out now, what can we do? How can we build consensus? How can we build a partnership from here? Because I think all of us, to one degree or another, still hide these agendas like, yeah, I'm with you, I got it. Good example, Sierra Club, and I hate doubting them, but hey, took away my membership. So, you know, we're for you. We got people for you. However, I'm not gonna help you out, you know? Another good example is what ASME did down in Springfield, Illinois. ASME is that asked Occupy Springfield to come to all their rallies. We came to the rallies. We're gonna go about Occupy our courts. What we were gonna do, hey, can you email, a simple email? come at this time at this location? Sure. Not a one came. Thousands of union brothers and sisters came out and occupiers came out with ask me shirts on. We asked them one simple thing, occupier courts, we're talking about courts, only one person came. Okay. So they actually, they actually have an agenda. So you also need like a written contract too. <laughs> Sometimes you do, it depends on who you're working with. Yeah. <coughs> I have you in the back. I have Wes right over here. I have you over here. Two things, one Ooh. real quick. Are you or anybody a paid staff? That's the first question. And the second is, as I recall, Sal was very confrontational and he did sometimes outlandish things as an example. One time, somebody that he was opposed to woke up in the morning and there was a, a plate full of waste on his table. And that was, you know, <coughs> our highly unusual uh, tactics and confrontation. He was trying to change the power relations. I think what you're doing is a wonderful thing, but I wonder if you, you use some of the tactics? You, what, do you, what is your view on the tactics that he used? To answer your first question, we have a board and we have a staff 
um, but it's all volunteer. But having said that, there's sometimes we do get paid for an event that we do, or if we're working with someone else, then they'll maybe pay us just to help out. So if you're asking me if I make fifty thousand a year, I don't. You know, I I do what I do because I love it. I get paid for writing. I get paid for speaking engagements. Not this one. Um, which is fine. Um, I do things for free also, and I also work on political campaigns and all that. So I get I get income elsewhere. So um, I'm a full time activist to that degree. Um, I love Saul Alinsky because he's confrontational, and he's one of the models I've always looked up to about confrontation or being controversial. Because I'm always of the opinion you should you should throw a controversy in every once in a while just to keep people on their toes. A good example is this: um, one organization that we were involved we are involved with in Springfield is the Radical Student Unions, the student student campus, excuse me, student organization on campus. One of the things that they want to do, and class, I don't know if they follow through with it yet, but one of the things they want to do is the whole Palestine issue. What they want to do is build a mobile fence, and there's a Zionist church in Springfield, excuse me, excuse me Zionist temple in Springfield. This person has spoken out about Palestine, Zionism, what have you. What they want to do while working with us is to build this fence, and once people came out of the temple, put it right in front of it, the door, and show ID that if they were residents of Springfield, Illinois. Because in Springfield, there's a town called Rochester, Chatham, all that. So we want to see IDs of people who actually live in Springfield. So if you live in Springfield, you can cross the fence. If you didn't, you stay in the temple. Sounds like that is an arrestable offense. Exactly. <laughs> so we want we want we want to be part of that because these are the things that we want to visually show what someone in Palestine goes through every day. So we want to show those kinds of examples, those kinds of actions, because people need those kinds of things every now and then. Um, one thing I was a part of is that it was a flash mob. And it represented how many people were dying that week during the Iraq war. So we got like 50 people. It's a very small number, we got 50 people. And we were walking around Thompson Center. Then all of a sudden, once they heard a whistle, everyone dropped dead. And everyone asked what's going on. He goes, this is how many people are dying like right now in Iraq. So, so the answer to the question, yeah, we do try and push the envelope a little bit because, again, that creates conversation. It's okay to be in your safe zone, but you also should push the envelope just a little bit just to have that conversation and to get that perspective like, well, I don't agree with it, and here's why. Well, why don't you agree with that? Hopefully that answers your question. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I see that you What? What sort of uh, conversations do you suggest between uh, Greens and Obama? Bless you, know we, bless you know we try to have this conversation with the Obama people. <laughs> um, what my suggestion for the Green Party and um, Obama people, if you will, um, and these are things, again, I try to have a conversation with, to have talk about issues like public option, talking about getting people out of Iraq. Um, we try to have these conversations, and I think in order to do that, we need to have a serious conversation about why do we, why are we who we are as Greens, and why they are as Obama people, and try to find a common denominator. Because there are, there are people who are considered Obama people who agree with Greens, with the same key values and what we do. But they need to come to meetings, they need to come to our events, and, importantly, they need, to, they need to listen. Instead of be like, oh, I voted green. That's about fine. That's fine. They need to do more than that. They need, they need to do more than vote for Jill Stein or 
vote for Lee Allen Jones, who's running for Senate, or excuse me, Congress this year, or for Tom Tresher, who, is, who ran for Cook County Board President. They need to do more than that. They actually need to be involved and actually have conversations instead of just coming to a meeting, leaving, and that's it. So that's just what my thoughts about that. All right, one more question for me. That's your last question. Well, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> is there any way to get the North Side Cub fans and the South Side Cub and the Sox fans together in some kind of consensus? I don't think it's possible. Can you can you uh, tell me how you could do something like that? Please. Obviously, this is like a funny show. So as a so as a Brewers fan, ooh, ooh. I'm not going to answer. <laughs> How about you, you, and then I'll come over here. All right. Yeah, I don't know if you addressed this earlier, but I see that you're wearing a green shirt with yes. a, a red, red star. star. I'm wondering, are you trying to make a statement with that? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, because it symbolizes, like I said earlier, who I am. That, you know, Marxist, anarchist, and green, you know, with the green. Mm -hmm. um, the star, as you, all of you may know, the red star being the Zapatista star. Um, ELZN, um, so I, that's why I wear it, so I've always liked the red star, and no, because um, this isn't a nice shirt I want to wear today, so. <laughs> well, I mean, you put it on conscience. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, Victor Tupac and Ellen. That's two part question. The first one. Yeah. This is simply a subjective question. So, yeah, I, I expect a subjective answer. Okay. In fact, you can say it's you. But who, who nowadays uh, comes close to Saul Orlinsky? And second, what is the future of the Green Party? Is there a chance that we it might become a viable third party? I'm going to answer this last, second one first, and I'll come back to the first one. Um, are Greens viable the winners? Um, yes, here's why. For some people, if you guys may or may not know, there's nearly 200 elected Greens in the United States. There's nearly 200 elected Greens in the United States, from California to Bangor, Maine. The Green Party is the only political party that's a universal party. By that I mean, if I say conservative, the ideology of conservative in the United States, is different when I say conservative in the United Kingdom. That's why liberal is different in the United States than liberal means in, in Australia. Green Party, if I say Green Party in Oakland, California, and Green Party in Auckland, New Zealand, it means the exact same thing. Same, tea, same, same 10 key values in New, York. in New York. It doesn't matter. So with that said, we have nearly 200 elected Greens in the United States, six of them here in Illinois, we have a Green elected in Australian Parliament, Canadian Parliament, Japanese Parliament, French Parliament, German Parliament, Irish Parliament. Uh, I think we have one in the United Kingdom. And one of them in Germany almost beat Merkel in her local race to keep her position. Because I think that Green got 41%. So are Greens electable when based on that? Yes. And I also feel Greens are going to be more elected because it needs to, it actually needs change. Because the 2012 election that we just had, you know, we saw more of the same going in. And in fact, a good example, which just happened in Chicago, you got Derek Smith reelected. You have LaShawn Ford reelected, and look what happened there. Jesse Jackson got elected. Look what happened with them. So people had enough. People are having enough right now. And people need to get out of social convention and saying, well, it's just Democrat and Republican, because there's not, because there's Greens and other third parties to be elected as well. Libertarians have over 200 people elected in the United States. And there's 10 of them in Illinois. So third parties are viable parties. And put my Green Party hat on, please vote Green Party. So, um, so answer your question, yes. And 
Who's more closely to Saul Alinsky these days? Oh man. I don't think I can answer that because I think there's a lot of other great organizers out there that um, are at the same level as Saul Alinsky. A good, I think the best answer for that is this. If you're asking me that, it's, it's just like the same thing asking me like, who's like Michael Jordan today? I can't say that because Michael Jordan's Michael Jordan and Derek Rose, Derek Rose. Saul Alinsky, Saul Alinsky, and AJ Zanieri is AJ Zanieri. So what I'm doing, this is what I do. I can't be Saul Alinsky because I can't be him if I was. Anybody that comes close Any, to I don't see, I, see I, I don't think I can do that because it's just like asking me who comes close to Che Guevara. I can't. I I'll <laughs> then give your answer later on. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask um, about what you think the effectiveness. Um, I, have, I suppose I have an issue with the effectiveness of even groups that come together because I read about how like 350.org has these huge demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Um, these massive demonstrations, mm -hmm. my understanding, and yet um, the administration, Obama administration, you know, climate change is a very low priority item for them. And so it's like, how do you affect change even when you have, you know, these large demonstrations? Sometimes, yeah. even as an organizer, sometimes you have to look at it's like the wizard. You see the wizard in front of you. Sometimes you have to pull that curtain and expose who that organization is. And this is what I mean. I was asked to go to Tampa, Florida to protest the Republican National Convention. I was asked by a friend to go down, and he said everything's bought and paid for. Plane tickets, hotels, food was free. I was like, wow, this is awesome. I've never gotten this before. And I can just go to Florida for free for, for about four days. So I get my plane tickets via email. And the very top it says, um, lobby government discount. So I kind of scratch my head. I'm like, I'm not a lobbyist. And I don't work for the government. So I'm kind of confused. So the organization my friend works for, um, I thought was a good organization. So we get to Florida, and it says, you know, there's a headquarters down in Tampa that we have to go to with other organizers down there. And there's organizations like Fighting for a Free, Fighting for a Fair Economy, Washington State, Tennessee, Florida, Philadelphia, um, Jobs for Justice in D.C., D.C. statehood people. I'm like, all right, this is, sounds like the kind of crowd I... Work around with him. Medea Benjamin was down there and everything. I was like, oh, this is, this is kind of cool. <laughs> it wasn't until the next day, because um, the day the day we went down there was like all organizing and all this. The next day, now I'm seeing SCIU Obama. Now I'm seeing a lot of SCIU stuff. Now I'm seeing this and that, that's kind of Democratic related. And I'm still scratching my head. I'm like, I don't feel comfortable about this. I don't know what's going on. And it actually resoluted, excuse me, resolved my unsettlement because one of the actions we were going to do was to protest um, Outback Steakhouse. They have a headquarters down in Tampa. And the thing we were going to do was we were going to send this big letter, or a letter, and then we were going to protest outside of Outback Steakhouse if they want to accept us into the door. Before the buses pulled up, and there's four buses, before the buses pulled up to the office, we are in a, we go into a mall parking lot, and there's four squad cars around my bus. Now I'm concerned, and I went, and I have on my speed dial my attorney at this point. They're surrounding us. Now I'm seeing helicopters around the buses. We pull up to the Outback Steakhouse headquarters, and there's National Guard, there's state troopers, and there's Tampa's finest right there. I don't get an escort like that, but I kind of felt kind of, okay, this is not so good. 
What happened was SEIU sent a media advisory out early saying we're going to do this and the police got it and they're going to arrest us right then and there. So to answer your question, sometimes you have to expose the people who they are. There's, there's 350 who's a decent organization, but I'm sorry, it's a democratic organization. They're with the Democratic Party. I've seen funding to the Democratic Party by certain by certain people. So I guess that's my whole point. When I was down there, I felt kind of used because an organization was using me for my talents for what they wanted to do. So in order to do that, you have to you do your research on the people you want to work with or people you want to have conversations with as well. You have to expose you know who's Who's the wizard behind the curtain? Hopefully that answers your question. I mean, I know it's maybe a roundabout way of saying that, but we can talk more about that if you want. So. Uh, would it be fair to say that the uh, Greens and the Socialists are basically the same? Yes. Can we elaborate on that more? or just? Well, yeah, I think Greens and Socialists are the same because I think we, we fight the same issues what Socialists want. Um, and I'm, even, I'm still trying to have conversations with my Socialist friends and Greens. Um, I'm still trying to find a good way to approach that, but I'm still having conversations individually on how to bridge how the Socialist Party and the Green Party can work together, not only at the state level, but the national level. And I was even at a International Socialist Organization Conference at, at Northwestern University, and they were actually talking about ISO people voting green during the election. I didn't, I didn't bring it up, and I was having these conversations afterwards saying, why do you want to vote green? Can we have a further conversation? So I do think there is a chance to vote, excuse me, a chance to build relationships with socialists. It's just a matter of what do we need to do to bridge that relationship. This is serious. Have you ever heard of the work of Gene Sharp and his uh, book called um, How to Start a How to Build, How to Start a Revolution? And it's Albert Einstein Institute. And if you could, could you comment? Um, first of all. You went over your one question a lot. Um, <laughs> FYI. Secondly, no, I haven't read that book because um, it sounds interesting. You said it's a book inspired by Albert Einstein or? He calls himself the Albert Einstein Institute and he wrote a book on how to, it's called From Dictatorship to Democracy. And he talks about how to take down a, a, a foreign government that may be oppressing their people and rebuild it to a big government thing. And he's got uh, a movement with people that started in Bosnia and the Balkans and they've been going around the world as, quote, revolutionary consultants and are one of the movements behind the uh, Arab Spring. You haven't heard about him? I'm, it's quite, quite surprising because he has done a lot of community organizing, a lot of consensus building, and a lot of conversation, and a lot of political actions to change these governments. I've heard of some of the examples that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but his name alone does not quite stand out. I'm sure if, if I read the book, or even do my own research about him, I'm sure I'd be like, oh yeah, I remember that guy with so-and-so and everything. But, with that book particularly, no, and it sounds interesting because those are the kind of books that I'm more interested it's in. It's completely downloadable from his website. Really? So it's a free download? It's a free download. Well, it's only 136 pages long. Where is it? Where is it? What it's website? the Albert Einstein Institute. Yeah, it's really And it's, uh, and he's been running a book. Somebody who's got Albert Einstein. Any other questions? Because I think I've entertained most of your questions. Okay. Yeah, I got yes. one. Charles. I got a couple here, right but, a couple. you know, uh, I, I've been in the organized labor movement for quite a few years, and uh, 
I go in to see various management officials, mm -hmm. and they don't want to have conversations with me unless I bring someone from the Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we have conversations. Yes. Or if I bring in the summons or something yes. like that. It's, this model doesn't seem to work for us too well. Mm -hmm. yes, people are for something that specific? No. Oh, thank you. Because again, what I'm talking about is... I mean, you want, you're going to have a conversation with Walmart? No, we've had conversations with our Walmart workers, trying to bring them all together, as well as from Target, from Home Depot, and other and the alike, to come together and talk about how not only they, all of those people, excuse me, the workers in Occupy Chicago and other organizations to come together and have these conversations to correct attention. It doesn't do any good to talk to somebody you can't grant the remedy you see. Talking among yourselves is wonderful. But if nobody in that room or that group can grant the remedy you see, what do you do? Commiserate with one another? Well, like I said before, I mean, with our Walmart campaign, in Occupy Chicago, we were planning logistics for the Black Friday events in Chicago, as well as the ones I've worked with in, in Champaign, Illinois. So we were planning more logistical things and trying to organize other people and other allies just to go into Walmart who were not workers to go in and do certain direct actions in Walmart and everything. So we weren't having conversations for the sake of conversation. We were having conversations on how to plan direct actions, as well as how to get media attention, how to bring in people to conversations. Because once you start having all that, then you're going to have other people pique their interest. I'm like, oh, that worked. But how that works? One, one further follow-up. Yes. If your activity was engaged in organizing the union, you have protection of labor laws. Yes. If you're just a bunch of people who are doing some kind of actions, you do not. You're subject to arrest. Yes. So that wouldn't sound like a good idea for an idea, would it? That's because we had some people who actually got a hold of labor laws and laws of Walmart, and we read through them line by line to understand what we can do legally and what we can't do legally. Like, we can legally talk to people on the break, on the premise, legally. We can also do certain things legally, like one of the laws in Walmart is that a manager has a right to fire somebody if they even talk about a strike, which they can't according to their policy that I have a copy of. I don't look at Walmart, but I have a copy of it. Yes. Oh. Let's get into the rebuttal period. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you for uh, your Now, let's see, how many of you would like to speak? Let's see, one, two, three, four, That's good. five, yeah. six, How you doing, sir? Six. Give him about six. Of course you can. Okay. About six minutes, promise. Yeah, all right. That's the yeah, same one. Six line. minutes yeah. apiece, uh, maximum. Uh, so at the end of six minutes, you, you get a signal. I've got some more coffee, honey. You're out of yeah. time. Okay, did you bring your guns? <laughs> six minutes. All right. Uh, so our first speaker will be Joe Mayer. The question has been asked many times this evening, how do you organize individuals and large groups of people? The simple answer, and it always works, the three-step process, persistence, number two is don't give up, and number three is keep trying. It works all the time. Um, 
My mentor was Albert Weisbord, who in 1937 wrote a book called The Conquest of Power. Um, it's an amazing book. It examines groups, small and large, who have come to power through the types of things that we're talking about tonight. Um, he runs from uh, the conflict between mercantilism and liberalism in the uh, 17th century, and he brings it up to the time when he wrote the book in 1937. And he, and he spends a lot of time on fascism and, of course, the uh, Soviet uh, uh, revolution in 1917. Uh, What's the name of the book again? Conquest of Power. It was published in 1937 by Kovici Frida, and uh, it's a two-volume set. It, 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 it's also free on the web. It, uh, uh, Weissboard, W-E-I-S-B-O-R-D dot O-R-G. Um, but but it, it, it's a marvelous compilation of all of the techniques that people have Here used throughout the last 300, 400 years to be able to come to power, even though they were small groups, they eventually uh, enlarged the group and, and came to power. It, it seems impossible, but nonetheless, it has happened. Everything that we've experienced in history now testifies to that. Um, Janis Joplin sang a song that was written by Chris Christopherson. It was called Bobby McGee, and there's a wonderful stanza in there, the phrase, um, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. And that is one of the key organizing techniques that we can use. When you find a group of people who have nothing left to lose, who have been out of work for years, who are uh, starving, who have some sense of social uh, connection, um, they have nothing left to lose, and they will be more than happy to join an organization that will, in fact, uh, uh, elevate their position, and they're willing to sacrifice themselves for that principle. As strange as it may seem, it works all the time. Um, but one of the things that we do have to worry about is the infiltration of our organizations uh, by elements that are inimical to the... Uh, purpose of the organization. And I'm reminded in uh, 1952, by actual survey, it was determined that one half of the party members of the Socialist Workers Party were members, uh, employees of the uh, FBI. <laughs> At least they had to pay them a lot. All right. Uh, sit <laughs> Like he said, uh, there has to be an objective condition, and there is to some degree in the United States, about a hundred million people in the United States are either under the poverty line or very close to it. So there is a base, I think, for changes, and if somebody comes along with the right program and is able to get the uh, message out to a large degree, uh, it could happen. Now, if we look at the last election, we had the Republicans and the reactionaries pouring millions of dollars into the election, and they thought they would win. Now, Obama was an organizer on the South Side, and he learned a lot from it. And with that organization, they went around to people, especially the labor unions, knocked on people's doors, and had face-to-face uh, -face contact with people, and told them what would happen if uh, Romney actually won the election, if reactionaries actually won the election. And we have a majority, almost, of uh, minorities in the United States, and they knew that if Romney got elected, they'd be in a lot of trouble. That's not to say that Obama is a great man or he's going to do anything unless he's pushed into it. Now, once you, once you get that started, if you use the right tactics, and he did use the right tactics to get elected. Now, what, what, another thing that you have to do, you have to use the scientific method 
in, in order to uh, change people's minds, and you have to test. You have to test different, different ways of doing things and see if that works. And you have to test it in different situations. Now, if you see if that particular tactic works in a particular situation, then you keep repeating it. But there might be other situations, and situations are constantly changing. So you have to use other tactics in that type of situation. You have to be flexible to a large degree. Now, uh, Dr. Laura brought up the fact that, the, that somebody said about voting. And in that particular case, like we had recently with the election, voting was the main contradiction. That is, if we got the Republicans in and the reactionaries in, you might have a police state in the United States. It's not to say we don't already have to some degree of police state, but it would get a lot worse. So you have to... Uh, use that tactic of voting in that particular instance. But in other instances, you might use another tactic, like street demonstrations, or maybe uh, what they do is acting out a particular thing, like somebody dying in a particular area, showing what the war is doing, and things of that nature. So the tactics got to change with the situation. Constantly got to change with the situation. If you want to use a scientific method, that's a scientific method to use. Now, eventually, it's going to come to a point, I think, in the United States where the economy is going to go into the drain. Because we have a financial situation that's very tenuous, and a situation where you might have a real downturn in the economy that will make the last, the last depression look like a tea party. Then you'll have the objective conditions in which to carry out these different things and to come to power. Our activist friend here likes to talk about bringing people together with divergent views and talking about those divergent views. Well, I can think of no other way to talk about these divergent views and to present mine. <laughs> And that is, you owe more about your social activism to the guys like Bill Gates, Sergey Brin, and Larry Page. And of course, the infamous gentleman who started it all, the infamous marketer of the 1920s, who, and I don't know what his name, oh. Greenspan. Not Greenspan. Bernays. Edward Bernays. There we go. And the father of modern marketing. <laughs> In order to have a, bit, a viable business model, you need to bring a group of people together to get their dollars from you so that you can make a profit. When you bring these people together, you have to do something called marketing. You have to do something called what's in it for me. I can think of no better example just this week alone about people getting organized than the Consumer Electronics Show that was recently held in Las Vegas. And boy, do they have some neat technology coming out. But why are they doing it? Because they see that it will better people's lives or have a perception that they'll get much better. And for you, a lot of you leftist organizations your methodologies, your stuff has been proven not to really work as well as what I consider a good old-fashioned capitalistic system of market forces and of, of good old-fashioned hard work, legitimate business runnings. Because if, a per if Walmart all of a sudden doesn't have any customers, Walmart goes out of business. So what did Walmart do when they started having problems? They came up with a new logo, they started modernizing their stores, and they started, in some sense, their workers aren't treated well yet, but they will be, because their corporate image is in at stake at this point. And when, they, when companies worry about losing customers, 
or their group, quote unquote, buzz about various items or whatever, they respond. Tim, now, who, made, who brought their corporate image down? The activists. The activists brought their corporate image down. See, that means you've got to organize and do it, correct? Now, what I'm going to say to you is this. If you really want to do some good old-fashioned organizing, just go back to what Edward Bernays did and how he brought smoking into the mainstream. Did you realize that this guy, there used to be a tradition in New York City called the Easter Parade where all the young women would come out in their fashionable best and walk down Fifth Avenue. So what did he do to make smoking glamorous? He hired about 30 models, well good looking women, and they were smoking on Fifth Avenue on Easter Sunday and all of a sudden they're in all the fashion magazines and the models and smoking became very glamorous. And of course, Mr. Bernays was paid very well by the tobacco companies. Later in life, Mr. Bernays then changed his tone to help the National Lung Association defeat smoking as well. So, you can take these modern aspects of marketing and work it well. I'm also a member of a group called Postmasters International, which is a public speaking organization, and I've been involved with it for well over 12 years. And I can tell you, constantly we're always trying to do the marketing things bring members in make it a good experience you know use the social media to organize and the one thing that we've always found though is that when somebody comes to a meeting or an organization it's the basics are they made to feel welcome are they made to feel a part of something a little bit bigger are they made to feel that they can help contribute something I also go to a church called Springbrook uh, Church out in uh, Huntley, Illinois. And when I joined it, it's the same thing. I was made to feel welcome in the organization. I was made to feel like a part of uh, building a community. And I was founded, and I found it to be a very good organization. I've got some friends involved with them, and I agree with what they do. Although I may not agree a lot with the methods or the ideology of the left, I do think that the goals are the same to a large part. What you're trying to do is better people's lives in, by humanity. You're trying to get rid of exploitation of workers and you're trying to get rid of a lot of other things, which in a sense I do agree with. I just don't think though that some of the methods that are used or the ideology presented works. I see a lot more revolutionary change by the likes of a gentleman by the name of Sergey Brin and Larry Page by inventing a better search engine so that you guys can organize better. I also feel too that Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and a lot of and for and Dale Carnegie have done more to change the world in a revolutionary way than anybody else brought in. First of all, they were rich men. Second of all, they had a great philanthropical arm. Carnegie gave us a lot of the libraries. Bill Gates is working to solve problems like malaria and public health and education. And of course, Bill Gates, although he's an investor, takes a good look and he's donating a large part of his fortune to the Gates Foundation to work on this stuff. Now, many of you guys in the Occupy movement, I've looked at this stuff. And it's the same old, same old things. You know, workers' rights, exploitation, get rid of the corporations. You know, my, I honestly think that corporations are, are a good thing. They organize people together. Oh, yeah. And Time's up. they can go, time Time's may be up, up but uh, guess what? Uh, Time's up. I love uh, capitalism, and I think it's the Time's best up. system on earth. Time's up. Yeah. 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 I told you before, he went and helped the National Lung Association later on. For for multinational corporations. petroleum. Okay, in grand tradition of the college, I will rebut even though I didn't hear this question, most of the questions. And, and kind of off topic, too, for that matter, because it's not any for me to begin with. Well, they don't want to listen to me.
so what. Uh, so basically, I'm kind of using you guys as a sounding board because I'm starting to read a very like interesting book by uh, oh, Sikiru Hutchinson, and it's called Moral Combat. She is a black feminist uh, atheist, which makes her a member of three different um, minority groups. And in her first chapter in the book, she analyzes the place of the black church in the community, which was something that you were talking about with the, um, the were um, addressing the like um, lesbian gay issues. Traditionally, the black church is very embedded in in, in the community, the black community, and um, there are many. Uh, and opposed to the decreasing number of uh, the general population who attend church and find religion and a belief in God as being very important in their life, those numbers have been going down. In the black community, those numbers are pretty high. Um, I think altogether it's at least 60% of people in the black community say that religion is very important to them. And 80% of the women say that religion is very important to them. Women support, black women support the black churches. And, um, and, most of the, and almost all of the black churches are actually run by men, not by women. But the women support them. The, the black community ties that pay 10% of their income, and that's much more common with black families than it is with uh, white families in terms of supportive churches. But uh, Ms. Hutchinson's, uh, actually it's Dr. Hutchinson's analysis is that the black church in fact has failed morally um, and can really no longer be a quote unquote moral spokesman because of their failure to act on several issues. One of them is consumerism, a la our friend here who just talked, and the fact that consumerist issues and, um, and being con conspicuous consumption is very much a part of black middle class and is uh, at least as destructive there or as, and, and, um, as it is in the white community, except of course it's much more destructive in the, in the white communities because there's many more of us than there are them. Um, the second issue is the, is the oppression of women. Um, that, um, that in black churches, women are not involved in leadership positions and are not seen as leadership people within the church, even though they truly do support the churches. And the black churches have traditionally come out against abortion, um, although uh, Martin Luther King himself accepted an award for Planned Parenthood and uh, cited uh, Margaret Sanger as being very important because she was able to help women control their own lives by helping them to uh, decide when to have children and if to have children, how to space their children, all those things that are vital to women's health. The third, the third issue is the, is the lay, uh, lay by, by lesbian, gay, transgendered, uh, bisexual people. Those rights that are um, that are absolutely denied by um, by the uh, black church. People are oppressed in the community. Um, if people cannot come out, either as an atheist, by the way, or as a, uh, a homosexual person, because of the, uh, the uh, extreme social censor and censor in those communities, because of that, and um, and that really hasn't changed. And what has happened then is that this, these, it makes them possible to be co-opted by the religious right, because those are the, the moral positions of the religious, the quote, the quote, moral positions of the religious right, denying civil rights to um, people with different uh, sexual orientations and denying civil rights to women. So that fits right in with them. And unfortunately, the, the actual agenda of the religious right um, is a, a white, fascist, racist um, philosophy that does things about uh, Obama was born in Kenya and he's, a, he's an Islamic uh, socialist communist and an atheist who's a Muslim. I mean, you know, it's, it's totally irrational. 
Um, so let's see what else did I want to say very quickly. About half a minute. Okay, the other point that she made is there has, because, well, even within the black church, there has been no substantive opposition, either within the black church or on the left, to any of these right wing, quote unquote, moral positions and the imposition of religion um, in the public supported by the state, which has been furthered by Obama with his faith-based initiatives where my tax money goes for some idiot preacher to proselytize um, wherever it is. So um, I guess that, again, that's not exactly what we were talking about, but um, I'm, I'm trying to organize all this in my head, and thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> your name? David Travis. Thank you for your attention. Uh, there are uh, many things can be taken to an extreme. Can you speak up? Speak up. Speak <clears> up. <throat> Sorry. There are many things that can be taken to an extreme that ought not to be. Uh, I knew a man in Pennsylvania whose father lived to be about 104, 105, and uh, he was determined to do much better than that. So he was a health food fanatic, and he bought milk that was unpasteurized from an Amish farm. He bought uh, eggs from another uh, uh, Amish farm that were not irradiated and so forth. And as time went on, he even got to a point where he would drink a certain portion of his own urine. They think <laughs> in, under the notion that that would in some way benefit him. Uh, this man died when he was in his 60s never came anywhere near the age of his father attained to. And by the same token, I'm sure you've all heard of a concept called eugenics. Uh, that is the concept of breeding out the bad and breeding in the good. Hitler took that concept and it led to horrible consequences. So uh, by the same token, uh, 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 the word community uh, has the same, it is from the same root word as commune or communism. Uh, uh, and so um, if you take community to its extreme, you go headlong into communism if you are that dedicated of a of being into community but uh, the, the fact is that um, uh, that's taking it to an extreme uh, everyone likes um, mo well most everyone likes community unless they're a hermit or something uh, we we want to have a certain amount of community even died into world capitalists or libertarians want a certain amount of community. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, is that I heard a gentleman here tonight say, why uh, talk to somebody who owns a gun? Well, if you take two uh, individuals or two groups that are uh, opposed to one another, one believes in gun ownership, the other one doesn't, uh, the, the fact is, there's only about three things that can be done. One is they can talk, negotiate, or they can do nothing, or they can fight, maybe try to kill each other. Uh, the, the, at the height of the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union had negotiations. Uh, it is uh, the lack of negotiation that causes a problem. The, IRA, that is the Irish Republican Army, and the uh, and 
Great Britain uh, had uh, quite a spat for a long time, and uh, the, the IRA was blowing things up and throwing bombs and all kinds of stuff. But through negotiation, that was in it. And both sides have been much better off ever since that time. So it's always better to negotiate and try to work things out than to uh, take the other alternatives. Uh, also, I wanted to say that uh, uh, that, that um, we, um, with, with respect to capitalism, I heard a gentleman say that uh, that uh, uh, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Uh, I think you'd be hard pressed if you talked to those early Americans that had a terrible struggle with England uh, in order to gain our independence. Uh, they would uh, very much, they did very much appreciate their freedom. And so uh, capitalism, uh, and another thing, capitalism, people talk about, I've heard it said here, the old capitalism was this, that, and the other thing. And the new capitalism is much more humane. I say capitalism is capitalism. And I think what they mean to say is that the tactics of the old capitalists, which were very cruel, <laughs> but they are not part of capitalism. They were tactics used by people to attain what they wanted. Today, we understand capitalists, most capitalists understand that it is in capitalism's best interest to see that the workers are well taken care of and kept oh, happy. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. It, it, uh, can I please have the floor, Charlie? Uh, it, it is best for, for business. I mean, if your workers are going to be going on a strike, it's only hurting you. So if you uh, treat your workers right and you, and you keep your workers happy, then your go, it's, business is going to continue and you're going to be more profitable. It's as simple as that. Uh, the, the, you always have some people who are cruel and will want to use their position to do cruel things to other people. But that's not capitalism, nor is it communism. There are communists who did horrible things to people uh, uh, in the name of communism. But that wasn't communism. I'm sure any communist in this room would readily tell me that that's not what communism was about. That was just a tactic. So I think it's important to keep these things in mind. Thank you. My name's Howard. My name's Howard Court. I want to bring up a different aspect of what we've talked to so far. When you think of the word, of the phrase "building community," um, and that is the places where people live, I mean the actual neighborhoods and small communities where people live. Um, from my point of view, strengthening life in small communities and neighborhoods is a very essential thing about building community because if you have strong small communities and neighborhoods, children are going to grow up right. They'll learn about mutual aid, about cooperation, and they'll different ways that people work. They'll learn a lot that will help them later in life in the larger society. But if there's a breakdown in the neighborhoods and small communities, you'll feel it in 
negative things that will happen in the society. Um, now there are a few authors in particular, I'll mention two. One was Baker Brownell, who wrote a book called The Human Community. Another one was Arthur Morgan, who wrote The Small Community. Morgan was the first chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, and when he left the, the TVA, he got in a fight with Roosevelt, but that's a side issue. But afterward, he uh, settled in a small community in Ohio, and he said that he thinks that he would have been better off to spend those years when he was working on TVA, which was very successful, if he had worked on trying to strengthen small community life. And he formed an organization called Community Service Incorporated, which still exists in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And he said working on that level might have done more for society than what he did on the major level. That was his opinion. But just to take this, uh, you know, into our situation here, I'm, I'm new to this city. I've only been here going on seven years. But a lot of my life has been spent in small communities in upstate New York and in Cleveland, Ohio. I mean, that was suburban, but mostly in small communities. And I'm really very pleased that in this city I'm becoming aware of neighborhoods, which is so seems to be such a strong element here. Yeah. But I think that small communities and neighborhoods deserve attention and effort and thought by the federal government, state, and local to strengthen life in small communities and neighborhoods. Uh, for instance, and uh, let me just contrast a suburb with a small community. A suburb is very specialized, and the kids growing up don't know very much about the variety of occupations that there are. You know, their father or mother go and work elsewhere. They never see where they were working. Uh, people are highly specialized, but in a small community, I mean, uh, this is ideally, it doesn't always work, but kids growing up, they see the fire trucks, they see the local machine shop, the grocery store, um, other things like that, and they grow up and they see the variety of opportunities there are, they see how people work, they see the cooperation that occurs or doesn't occur in the community, they know most of the people in the community. They know the different types in the community. They see them at work, at church, um, at the playground. They see them in different phases of their life. They see a broader picture. Now, to some degree, that occurs, I think, in some neighborhoods also. Uh, a neighborhood, especially if it has some industry, some businesses within the neighborhood, so that people don't have to always go far away to work. And neighborhoods can also, I think, be an important educational enterprise. Another aspect, for instance, in a neighborhood, a good neighborhood, let's say a kid has a pop bottle and he smashes it against a wall. He drops it, he laughs, walks off. Now, in a good neighborhood or a small community, somebody would say to him, an adult, why did you do that? Or tell him that that's not the thing to do. Why do you, you want to ruin life here? You want to cause cars to crash? In a bad community, he'll be ignored. Or somebody might even laugh and encourage him. But in a good small community or neighborhood, kids will learn that. And not only their parents, but their neighbors and other people in the community help to socialize them. At least this is theoretically. It doesn't always work, but to some degree it does. So what I just want to say is that in addition to the aspect of building community in the ways we've talked previously, I think some attention has to be put on strengthening life 
in neighborhoods and small communities. And I think it really should be brought to the level of legislators to consider that. And read some, there's a lot of literature on this field. I'd suggest this is a start, for instance, and I knew Morgan personally. Uh, after he left the TVA, he went back to Antioch College, and he was president, and then he lived in the community. Well, I got to know him, and his book he wrote, The Small Community, um, the foundation of American, uh, the foundation of democratic life, it was published by I think it was Harper. In any case, you can find it on the internet. And he later wrote another book called The Community of the Future and the Future of Community. Baker Brownell wrote The Human Community. There have been a lot of other people after that, but there's a whole field of study about small communities and neighborhoods and how to strengthen them. And I think that's an important agenda. I might also say they point out that most of human life in the uh, centuries that it's existed has been in small communities. And, okay, we live in a, a very large city, but, and we can't go back, everybody, to small communities, but we could work on strengthening our neighborhoods and our local associations so that we can have a real community life here. In addition to all the stuff about changing society and what uh, Alinsky did, etc. But this is just a, another aspect of the whole issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, well. <laughs> I'm actually going to build a bit on each of the last few comments. There's a good possibility that the communities will have to end up being smaller <laughs> because the technology which allowed for the building of the big communities may end up going down the drain because of peak oil. Yay! All right. Now, with respect to Dave, Dave's drift, especially at the end, he made a very good point, which ought to be boilerplate, but maybe it's not. And I'll, I'll just sort of rephrase it and run with it in a different direction. You can have a meeting, a convention of all the, quote, capitalists in America, or you can have a convention of all the, quote, communists in America or the world, whatever. And you can have a whole bunch of folks showing up. And look, all the, quote, communists, unquote, will have red stars or some such, all right? And they'll pay lip service until the cows come home to communism. And in the capitalist convention, you'll have a bunch of dudes waving green bills, right? And they'll pay lip service to capitalist ideology, whatever that is. Well, your problem is that lip service gets a lot of people a lot of what they want. And they might not need to do jack shit past paying lip service. And you can talk about bringing people together, and it's got all sorts of warm, fuzzy connotations. But I didn't, most yeah. of what I heard tonight here, quite frankly, was rather trite. <laughs> and until some folks in your crowd or whatever crowd it's going to be, actually tries to give serious thought to how to use, how to think about human nature and then how to take into account aspects of human nature and try to fit those in with whatever it is you're trying to do when you're trying to quote, bring people together I thought and try to bring some accountability to their interaction when they supposedly try to work together. The ice, my guess is you are going to just keep on spinning your wheels. Now, I brought up Charles Hugh Smith, who is a blogger. He writes just about every day. And he and I have corresponded privately. And one of his points was, you know, the Quakers, yeah, there's sort of a consensus shebang among the Quakers. But in order for you to get a seat at the table where you can, so to speak, block the consensus, the would-be consensus, and hold gum up the works, you can't just pay lip service. You can't just talk, talk. You gotta walk, walk. And until such time as outfits like yours actually make a distinction, and I'm gonna be putting a plug here in an odd way for Lenin. Lenin had the distinction, and so did Hitler, by the way, <laughs> between members and supporters. Yeah. Yeah. And if you were gonna have jack shit for a vote on Hitler's part, 
Party didn't have no voting, but Lenin's party did. But if you were going to have a vote, damn it, you had to walk a bunch of walk. All right. Now, you know, this is, you guys can do what you want, but um, it seems to me as though if you guys are going to go anywhere, there's going to have to be some sort of, really, some sort of profound thinking about process and some sort of study about, well, okay, under what conditions does consensus work? And maybe it works with the way the Quakers do it. And maybe it works in Japanese corporations where, again, Joe Blow just can't walk in the door and sit at the table in the boardroom. All right? But in Occupy, that's what could happen. And so a whole bunch of Joe Blows and Jane Doe's just strolled on in and effectively hamstrung the joint, as I understand. So, I don't know. And for starters, you know, whether you're not going to do Robert's Rules, well, let's put it this way. One of the beefs about how it went down in Zuccotti Park there was that the moderators, there was no way to hold them accountable. So they could just so happen to cut Joe Blow off because he wasn't going where they wanted to go and give extra time to Jane Doe because she was going just where they wanted to go. Okay, and there was no way, there was no Robert's Rules, no nothing to, hey, wait a minute, moderator. This is bullshit. We want to get rid of you and put someone in who's going to be fair about it all. But, you know, you guys, you guys do what you want. And one more consideration in, in, in these lines that there ought to be some talking about. If I remember right, it's called Dunbar's Number. But in any case, the idea is that it's one thing to have a, have a little powwow among a half a dozen people. And then it's another thing to have a small community of 150 to 200 people. That, as I recall, is sort of Dunbar's number. Once you get above the 200, give or take, and they don't know of each other well enough where they could even meet in a gymnasium, a school gymnasium or whatever, and maybe hash things out according to Robert's rules, once you get above that number, then you've got to split the joint up in the cells like the communists did. They had party cells here and there and there. Once, and, and the Hutterites. Uh, and who are the other, the, some of the outfits that where they lived together? But then the Mormons, that's it, the Mormon wards, as I understand. Once a Mormon ward gets above 200, they tend to split it up into two wards. Now, okay, there, then you, you can think about manageability. And then, of course, once you get up with a whole bunch of wards or whatever they are, of 200 give or take a piece, well, then you've got to have delegates sent up to bigger meetings. And you've got to have some sort of process to run the bigger meetings. And again, hopefully you'll come up with a process whereby neither, no one of these delegates thinks they're getting a raw deal by having some sort of axe-grinding moderator or axe-grinding process whereby some folks end up getting a hell of a lot more say than other folks get. Well, I don't know. Uh, but there's all sorts of ways to play the game. As I understand it, Stalin ended up taking over the party largely, the Communist Party, largely by seeing to it that his dudes were always the moderators. So there's all sorts of ways to play the game if you want to yeah. play for kids. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's called politics and representative government. Hey, all right. You rebut and rebut. A little housekeeping here. Uh, where's Howard? Did you need a ride? Yes. Where are you going? Uh, Briar and Sheridan near Belmont. All right, if somebody can give him a ride, Howard certainly would appreciate it. It's a little cold and rainy out there. We can help our people out. All right, so there's Howard back there. All right, I'll be eclectic. First of all, let's thank our speaker. I'm going to be eclectic, jump around all over the place here. Uh, he began by talking about organizing. Um, being a union organizer, it, the topic has come up on occasion. Um, what you're talking about, sir, is, is what they call community-based organizing, in which you go out and you talk one-on-one -on -one with individuals and then form an organization using that method. Uh, they even recommend like you go to see everyone in what we call a bargaining unit. Uh, I have a thousand, so that's a little bit hard to do. But nevertheless, they say try to reach out to everyone in that capacity. 
even give surveys and ask their concerns. That's the organizing I think you're advocating here. Now the other thing about uh, some of the activities though that you were talking about, uh, in terms of organized labor, you have to be very cautious that you are in fact organizing to establish a union. If you do not, the employees involved in it do not have the protection of any labor laws. You know that, Joe. There's thresholds on this. You clearly have to be engaged in activity leading towards the formation of a union. Not just going to rah, 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 you know, we don't like these guys. That doesn't kind of cut it. You've got to have something of a serious organizing effort in progress in order to have those protections because otherwise your wonderful places that you seem to like Walmart so much, I tell you what would fire anybody that could heard that came anywhere near it. They'd be out the door in the wonderful capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And Walmart really doesn't care what people think about it. Yeah. <laughs> if they did, they would have cleaned up their act a long time ago. They're not worried about their image, they're worried about making money and putting money in, the, make, making themselves rich. And they don't care on what means or methods, or they don't care what people think. <laughs> Capitalism have, capitalists have never cared what people think about them. You call them, oh, we're going to call you bad things. Oh, pl please stop or we'll call you bad, bad stuff. We'll say bad things about you. <laughs> Do you honestly think that works? And what kind of world are you in, man? <laughs> now, the other thing about organizing is there's another level altogether, and many, many people have become organized around issues, and they form, and I, as a librarian, I used to use this all the time, the Encyclopedia of Associations. And I very much like to join associations or organizations around an issue. I certainly can't get involved in everything, but I can throw a few bucks at an awful lot of number of groups. Maybe not a lot, but they keep going, and I think they reach a certain maturation beyond the community to address these issues. And many issues cannot be addressed at the community level. They're at the legislative level. That's where things are going to be done. I'm talking about the legislative issue. You talk about conversations, but I heard some AJ, I heard he's making some disparaging remarks about the Democratic Party. Now, I'm agreeing, too. But it just so happens that when we lobby, and I was planning my lobbying next week, is that I'm going to have to deal with an awful lot of Democrats. And those are the only people who are going to get me what I want. And I don't have a goddamn bad thing to say about any of them. Now, the Republicans is a different matter. <laughs> what? What? But if you truly want to engage in conversation... Now, the other thing about advancing your issue is you have to pick up allies. That's why you shouldn't be doing that. You've got the number one thing is to pick up allies. Now, if you see we're even planning a little railroad, if you go to that website, there's one page in where I put together a list of all the allies we need to get that railroad. And that's why we did it. And it's all on one page. It's a, that's the most important page. It's not even there for your use. It's for our use. But it, we're, we have an organization and those are all the people that we need as allies with our organization in order to achieve our aim. All right, but all right, so you don't like Democrats. I'm agreeing there, but they're, they're all right, though. Uh, let's see, uh, we've been over Walmart. Uh, conversations um, are wonderful things in terms of my own activities for advancing the conditions of employment. I don't place much value in conversations with the managers. Uh, I use more of a teamster boss approach, and you come in and this is what I want, or <laughs> something of that nature. A direct action gets the goods here. And one last thing, and I'm really going to digress here, and I was thinking about it, and I can't let you off the hook, Dave. I might even speak about this on the 4th of July, I put together a little program on the uh, American Revolution. But uh, there was a lot of talk here about structures and things of that nature. Um, the American Revolution was not fought for freedom. It was fought out of fear. 
that the British aristocracy was taking an interest in this country. That's, it was not freedom. They had freedom. Freedom from aristocracy. And they certainly had freedom of land, which was unheard of in, in Europe. But the aristocracy was taking an interest in their means of production and things of that nature. And in that sense, their freedoms were perhaps, that's what they were truly afraid of. They, before that, in the early stages, they thought the, pit, the place was a wilderness settled by a bunch of freaks and oddballs. And, but when it matured as a nation, they started showing and much made our interest and it was a source of income to them. All right, thank you very much. That was fun. So AJ responds, right? Yeah, you're gonna say anything? You agree with me then on everything, right? <laughs> That's good. Speaker. I said no. All right. No. Speaker gets the last word. Well, first, like I said in the beginning, um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, I think this is a, a great forum to have conversation, talk about what people's ideas are, and then hopefully we can move forward to continue on having conversations and, heck, if not build a community in this little group right here. I guess my final um, comments I'd like to make, and I want to go a little further what you said um, about community and like communism. It's funny you said all that. So I remember I told my mom at 13 years old the exact same thing about, I was trying to understand what communism was as a young kid and you know, taking the root word commune means community. And I try to understand that further to understand what communist countries were at the time. But now I feel at this, at this point in my life that, you know, without community, you need unity. And that's what the whole thing is with my presentation, that we need to build more unity by building community. And that's trying to now I have conversations, but trying to bring people to the table in order to advance on issues, whether it be at the city, county level, state level, or national level, or the international level. And the other last thing I would like to um, say is, um, you know, the best formula I've ever was told when to do things. You need to educate, you need to agitate, He's going to organize. I'm just going to leave it right there. So. I'm sorry, could oh. you repeat that? You, didn't you need to educate, you need to agitate, and you need to organize. Three simple, three simple formulas. I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay, Brom, close us out. All right, we've got some extra schedules there. Thanks for Very good. Do you have any checks to find you? You don't have any checks, do you? Oh, yeah. Hi.